Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. You guys, I want you to give a warm, warm welcome to my friend, John James. Yeah. Awesome. G'day, folks. Oh, can I get some music even? Yeah. G'day, welcome to church today. It is so awesome to be back in the mighty country of Texas. And um, we had a great time in the outback of Texas at the men's camp. Uh, and uh, just a wonderful time. And I just want to encourage you, if you weren't able to make this men's camp, please don't miss out on the next one. It was it was just awesome fellowship and hearing the testimonies where you know, the men could just get away and, and God could just move in our hearts. It was amazing. So I want to really encourage you, if you couldn't get to this one, do not miss out on the next one. Amen. Uh, before we come around the Word of God today, I must introduce, would you come up, darling, my better half? Make her feel welcome. Come on. Hey, you know, my wife and I, we celebrate this uh, December our second year anniversary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Yeah. Praise God. Um, it reminds yeah, sorry about that. But uh, we were we were just married only uh, a couple of weeks, not long, and and we ended up in a church ministering in Pennsylvania. And, and I'd been to this church several times before, and and the pastor got up. His introduction was, you know, family, isn't it great to have John James back with us again? And everybody clapped and cheered, and I felt like such a VIP. It was special. And then he says this. I'll never forget it. He goes, oh, for those of you who don't know. You remember when John was with us last, he was single, lonely, miserable, and going nowhere in life. (laughs) But now he's come back with a wife, and everyone's like, ah! So I want to thank the Lord. You know, it wasn't that long ago. It seems like, man, my life was not in a good place and if if you'd ever said to me that I would be so humbled and blessed again to have a second chance in life and to be known what it is to be married to the most incredible woman I just want to honor God because he is a God of the impossible and he is a miracle working God so without saying any more I don't want to put you on the spot but uh, other than just saying hi or g'day you got anything on your heart you just like to encourage the folks with I do well, last time I was here, you guys were probably like, wasn't she blonde when she was here last week? I have a, I'm having a midlife crisis, and it was either this or Corvette. So I was like, I'm just going back to my natural hair. This is so much cheaper. So I thought we both agreed on that. But anyway, I woke up at 4.30 this morning, and I just had a word on my heart. And I have never shared this from the pulpit. I think last time I was here, I shared a little bit about my testimony as a child, which was just bad. But get the tape from last time if you want to hear that. But on my heart was this. And I want to tell you, when John and I got married, I had a successful construction company in Broward County, Florida, was running that, doing really well, and we got married that December, and I felt like God's like, sell your truck, sell some of your equipment. I'm like, why would I do that? Like, why were we getting married? And not only that, but um, I was in the middle of a litigation over a piece of property with somebody in Florida. This piece of property was worth like half a million dollars, and somebody was fighting me over it. And I was two years in litigation, $20,000 in debt for somebody. It was just like boundary line. It was totally like shouldn't have been a lawsuit, but it was. And we came back from Australia, and God said to me, walk away from that land, walk away from it. I'm like, what in the world? So I called John. I'm like, this just doesn't make sense, or why would I do that? Because it's my property. And then anyway, I called John. I'm like, what should I do? He says, like, do whatever the Lord says to do, then do it. And I'm like, oh, I, Lord, this just doesn't make sense. I called my lawyer the day before Thanksgiving two years ago, and I said, this doesn't make sense to you, but I'm walking away. She's like, you've lost your mind. Like, we're going to court for next week. You've got, like, the nail in the coffin with what they were coming against you. I'm like, you don't know the God that I serve, but when God says walk away from something, he's got something better for me, amen? So I called that lawyer. I said, I want to sign the papers. I'm walking away, and she's like, okay. I drove one hour there to her office, signed the papers, came home, was filled with the joy of the Lord that I felt like I had done what he had done to me to do. When God says do something, you don't ask why, you just do it. And I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, y'all, and I tell you what, the devil was attacking me. Like, what did you do? What did you do? You're getting married in a month this could have secured your life with your new husband for a while you know 
Anyway, not only that, but he I gave up my company and January 8th last year, we put everything we owned in storage and went on the road. So we talk about give up everything that we could have fallen back on. We're just going to trust the Lord. We packed our car with everything we had in it, a Ford Fusion with 150,000 miles on it. And God said, go. I couldn't even bring my keyboard. And we had one speaking engagement in New York and we thought we were going back to Florida. Our lease had run up and we had to move out somewhere. We were just like, we don't know where to go. We had a piece of confirmation. But I'm telling you what, and I'm saying this because I know a lot of people have your job may be on the line with the government regulations. You might be a nurse, you might be a healthcare worker, you might be in police, law enforcement. My my son works for the Department of Defense. He's like, if I don't get this shot, I'm losing my job. Like I have a huge six figure. Anyway, I'm not here for or against, but they're going to lose your job. It is going to require you to have faith. Faith believes, fear, fear looks, faith jumps. And that's what we did January 8th. And I'm telling you what, we had $500 in our bank account. People think John James, Newsboys, rock star, getting royalties. He walked away from nothing from the Newsboys. Not only that, when we go to a church, we don't ask for a fee. We go, we drove from West Virginia to be here with y'all 20 hours in our car to go to bring the word to y'all. Because when God says, go somewhere, you go. Anyway, I'm saying you're good. a lot of you, and I've been preaching this message on Habakkuk about writing the vision down, making it plain. God has been giving a lot of you some dreams that don't make sense. It may be a business opportunity, it may be a business d decision or idea or a sales idea. I believe that God wants more Fortune 500 Christian believers and companies run in Facebook, companies like Facebook, business owned by Christian people that are believers in Jesus Christ. And I believe he's going to breathe on that dream and that vision. I'm telling you, we've had story after story of God's faithfulness, of his provision. Not only that, but we didn't have any money. So we started, we doubled our tithe to our local church. We stopped giving 10%. We're like, we're going to die without you, Lord. So we're not only going to like give the little bit that we have, we're going to give a little bit more of what we have, 20%. But I'm telling you also, and the pastor did not pay me to say this, I'm telling you what, our church in South Florida, before we left Florida, is a church of about 1,500 people. We met with the pastor one day. He said there's 7% of people actually tithe into the church. And I'm not here to, to condemn you or whatever, but I'm saying if you don't tithe, you're like, me, I can't afford to. You can't afford not to. I'm telling you what we saw time and time. I could tell a story. I could write a book over God's faithfulness when we jumped out of the boat and started giving. And I got this analogy, like you come every church to all you can eat is smorgasbord and you walk away with nothing. This pastor does not work 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. He is there when you call him at 3 a.m. 24-7. You should be driving a new Mercedes Benz. I'm like, you should be well taken care of. I'm telling you what, you're the spiritual mentor and head of this home. And you should honor your pastor. He, he's there when a loved one dies. He's there when you call him and you have a marital problem. His job never stops. And I love to see pastors blessed. And I love pastors to be, you know, not just, you have a vision. You need money to fulfill that vision. I'm just throwing that out there. But we saw when we did that, you cannot outgive God. And I'm telling you what, if you have a penny, it's a lot in his hands. That's all I have to say. Thanks, darling. Thank you, baby. Crikey, mate. I thought you were just getting up to say good day. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and I just want to, you know, it's never about, people get caught up on the money. It's, it's about the obedience. You know, my wife and I have known what it is to be blessed with more in our hand. We've known what it is to have a little in our hand. We've known what it is to have the fridge fill and the electric bill paid this month. We've also known what it is to have the fridge empty and believe in God for the very food on our table that week. It's all his. My wife put a figure to it, but you know what? It's all his. If he says, give, you give. If he says, trust me, I, I'm well able to take care of you. So I just want to encourage you on, on your walk of faith. And, and so I pray today that, let, let me pray. Father, I thank you for the work you've already done. From the moment we pull up in the car park, from the moment with the dawn of this new day, you are reaching out to your sons and daughters. Your spirit is wooing and drawing us, Lord. Even through the worship, Father, you're speaking to people's hearts. 
God, I pray that you would continue today, even through the message of encouragement Tanya just brought, through the Word of God that we come around now, would you challenge us, convict us, inspire us, set us free. Open our eyes, Lord, today. May we clearly hear the voice of the great Holy Spirit speaking to each and every one of us in a simple way that we can comprehend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. If you have your Bibles, would you open them? If not, don't worry, I'll read it to you. I think we might even have the Bible in the sky up there. Uh, do your best to follow. I could be reading from the Australian Outback version or some other version. But I want to read you a moment, in a moment, a scripture. This is probably one of the most, not one of the most quoted, named, claimed, confess, sung about. Maybe you've had somebody pray this scripture over you. Maybe you've prayed this scripture over a loved one, a son, a daughter, a family member. So I want to look at this today and I pray God begins to expand this message and inspire us all today. You'll know this well as soon as we turn to it. Would you open your Bibles or turn to the book of Jeremiah? Chapter 29, verse 11. This is what the Lord is saying to His people. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good, not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. So often when we read Scripture... It is so important to take the time to look a bit deeper and understand the context, the context, the context. I have a family member that was in real estate for many years and he used to always say to me, the key, three keys to buying a property is location, location, location. Well, with the Word of God, similar understanding the context who it was given to was it a specific word solely for a person or a people group or is it something we can take as the church in the New Testament and actually apply it to us on our journey so often I think but we can make the mistake of taking a scripture out of context and remolding it and shaping it and forcing it to apply to our life and our situation. Now I'm not here to get into the deeper depths, what's for applicable for us, what isn't. But whether a scripture is given to you and I today or whether it isn't, we can get an insight to the heart of God on a particular situation, on a particular matter. So I want to read that same verse back to you again. But now I want to put a little bit more meat on the bones. Give it a little bit more context to understand the actual environment and the situation that the Lord was giving the scripture to his people. I'll read it again. The book of Jeremiah chapter 29. But this time reading from verse 9 to 14. This is what the Lord is about to say to his people. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. When you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. 
I will gather you out of the nation where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. The context of this is that God's people were going into Babylonian captivity, Babylonian exile. I guarantee you that wasn't on the top of their bucket list. Their world is about to be dramatically changed the turmoil upside down going into captivity and at the time all the Jewish and Babylonian prophets were standing up supposedly prophesying in the name of the Lord saying to the people listen this crazy season of bondage that we're walking into don't worry it's gonna be over before you know it don't stress out before you know it life is going to return to like it was in the good old days can't help but think it kind of sounds a little bit familiar what we've walked through as a nation and a globe and this country over the last year and a half now I'm not here to use this platform and I never would to name or bag or tear down so-called prophetic ministries online because who knows that honestly over the last year and a half there's been a lot of people speaking out supposedly in the name of the Lord saying this says the Lord uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look back and realize in spite of these people who meant well and had good intentions a lot of them were wrong and here is the same thing in this scenario all these supposed prophets were saying don't worry about it it'll all be over before you know it the shipwreck the storm the craziness that we're about to go into the bondage it'll all be over before you know it and we can go back home now along comes Jeremiah <laughs> And he's like, let me paraphrase this. You're all a bunch of turkeys. Don't listen to these idiots. They're all wrong. Let me tell you what the Lord says. And he went into the whole passing. What's amazing to me that God actually laid it out clearly before that little one verse that we love to name and claim. And God spoke, actually, let me tell you, you're going to go into captivity for 70 years. Ouch! No matter how much you claim it, name it, bind it, tear it down, blow a chauffeur, you're going into captivity for 70 years. And it's part of my plan. But don't worry, I've got a plan. Because I'm about to send you into this storm. I'm about to shipwreck you on this beach. But don't worry, I'm in this. I'm in the storm. I'm in the shipwreck. I'm in the chaos. Don't allow it to cause you to lose hope. Because I'm going to send you through this according to my will and my purpose. Now, no one looks forward with anticipation to going through a really tough, painful season. You know what? The reality is, I wish we could go back in time and the last year and a half would, was so different. Amen? But the reality is we're walking through it. And I even want to suggest today that even though we're walking through the storm, maybe God's in the storm and he's going to use it for his glory, for his honour. Because walking through this craziness, God is going to do an incredible work in his church, in his people. And even like my wife was talking about, sometimes in the natural, God is asking us to give in the natural give I'm about to lose my job I can't give see so often kingdom makes no sense in the natural it doesn't make sense if you try to work out kingdom always with logic and reason you, you're gonna mess yourself up really quick because so often kingdom is back to front upside down right side up so here's this incredible scripture now if I had to give today's message a title, because I know our multimedia guys love titles, and if I don't give them a title, their world's going to fall apart. So I, well, I got to put a title on the website. So for the sake of my brother from another mother in the back in the media, I would call this message, and I think it's appropriate, church, for us today, for this church, for the church in America, for the church around the globe. I would call this message just keep 
going. Turn to the neighbour next year. Turn to that person and look at them and say, just keep going. Come on. Ha! Let me, let me lay the foundation of the next scripture. Would you turn please to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Reading from verse 1 to 3. This is what it says. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let's pause there. The writer paints this incredible picture inspired by the Holy Spirit. He paints this picture of, as believers, it's like we are surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses. Who's he talking about? Other believers with us? The community? He's actually referring to a chapter earlier where it spoke about the great men and women of faith that have gone home to be with the Lord now. They're in glory. But these men and women of faith, just everyday, ordinary, dysfunctional people like you and I, Come on. But they dared to step out and believe God. And God did the most incredible things in their lives and through their lives. But their time has now come to an end. And they've gone home to be wooden glory. But the writer alludes to, he paints like this picture, like these great men and women in faith are like in a grandstand of heaven. And 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 they're looking at us we're surrounded by this incredible array of witnesses and i believe it's like heaven is looking these great men and women of faith are looking to see what the generation of today of what we're going to do with the responsibility and the mandate of the great commission it's like the responsibility of faith now has fallen, has been passed on. The baton has been passed to you and I, the generation of today. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to run with passion? Are we going to just negate our responsibility? Oh, nah, nah, I'll give it to somebody else. Oh, are we going to say, well, you know what? No, no, thank you. Uh, I'm retired now. Let me quickly throw this in. If you are retired, God bless you. I understand that you've worked hard for years and, and you deserve a rest. And I understand in the natural, we retire from our vocation, yes? Newsflash, church. You may retire in the natural from your vocation, but you never retire from the kingdom of God. Never, 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 never. Our job now, as if you are older, as a retiree, isn't an eternal quest for pleasure and relaxation or maybe to be consumed now with that God-forsaken game of golf. It's okay, I was joking, all right. There's nothing wrong with enjoyment and relaxation and enjoying life, but we never forget the responsibility of the great commission that's been given to every one of us. Because I don't know if you realise it or not, one day, for some of us sooner, for some of us later, but one day we're all going to stand before God and give an account for his, our lives, <laughs> what we have done with Christ in our lives. We're going to stand before him and hopefully as we stand before him, we are a reflection of the image of Christ. Not a reflection of me, myself and I. I don't know about you guys, but one day when I stand before God, <laughs> I so, so, so want to hear, well done, incredibly handsome little poor man with an accent. Well done. I do not want to hear the other. The other is, depart from me. I never knew you. Excuse me? You never knew me. Don't you know who I was? I was the lead singer and co-founder of one of the biggest Christian bands in the world. Ooh. That doesn't impress God. Oh, Lord, you, you never knew me? I faithfully filled a seat in a church every Sunday for years. Doesn't impress God. What will impress him if we have allowed the spirit of God to 
change us into the image and likeness of Christ. If we haven't allowed the miracle of who we are in Christ, the good news that has been given to us, if we haven't selfishly kept it to ourselves or refused to use our life as a testimony for others, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear. The responsibility has been passed to our generation. Who is the generation today? If you woke up this morning and your heart is beating, guess what? You're alive. You're not dead yet, mate. <laughs> God's not finished with you yet. You are the, re- the generation of today. Has nothing to do, well, you know, I'm, I'm not in the ministry. I'm not a pastor. Guess what? We're all in the ministry. When you answered the call, when Jesus said, come follow me, you signed up in the kingdom of God, the army of God, not to be a spectator, not to just fill a seat, but to be proactive. Now, we might not all be pastors. We might not all be missionaries or evangelists, but we're all called to witness. We're all called to be a light, to use our life as a testimony to reach our neighbours, our friends, our, our communities, our workplaces. Amen. So let's continue quickly. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, then you won't become weary and give up. In the space of three verses, the word endurance was used three times. When you look at the original Greek meaning of that word, as it brings a context to the word endurance, in the original Greek, it means to bear up under the weight of, the ability to withstand great pain or hardship. Sounds like the last year and a half. The ability to continue despite fatigue, stress or adverse conditions. Today, we live in a culture like no other. It's almost like the word endurance has become a cuss word. (laughs) We live in a culture that wants to remove any endurance, any pain, any long suffering at all. It's like, we just want to cancel those words from our culture. We live in a world and a society that is so committed to making our lives comfortable and easy. We, We live today, we're a part of a culture that embraces quick, instant, now painless. We live in a culture that, don't worry, everybody gets a trophy just because you were born. (laughs) I work with kids, teenagers, youth. I understand affirming and inspiring young people. But that sort of mentality, you're setting people up for failure. And especially if you are a follower of Christ, newsflash, one day when we all stand before the Lord, we're all not going to get a trophy. We're all not going to get a crown. The word endurance, anything associated with pain or long suffering, remove it. We don't want to have anything to do with it. Even technology is changing us daily, subliminally. We don't even realise it. Everything in our culture is wanting to knock the wind out of our sail, especially when it comes to endurance, persecution or pain, anything that's involved with that moving forward. Technology is reshaping the way we're wired, the way we think. Let me give you a few examples. You remember in the olden days, you remember this, Pastor Marcus, the olden days. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.